Hello students and welcome back to Social Change and International Development. It says Globalization and Development. I guess that could be the title of this course. That is the title of a course I teach, very similar to graduate level, and sometimes I exchange the PowerPoint slides. So that may have something to do with it. All right, so Today, this is the Thursday lecture. I'm giving it on Wednesday, and we're going to talk about institutional approaches to development, which is a significant area of inquiry, analysis, and theorizing. And then we're going to talk about comparative capitalisms, which also highlights the variation in institutions that exist across what we call capitalist nations. Try to do this one recording. We'll see how it goes. I don't think there are as many slides. Maybe I can be a little less loquacious and excessive in my verbalizing as I go through the items that I want to talk about. All right, <clears throat> let's get started. Hopefully my allergies will not kick in and I will be able to speak clearly. All right, so two ways institutions have been examined in the development literature, the literature that you are now much more familiar with. We've talked about levels of analysis as ways to understand development. We've talked about modernization theory. This is a little recap. Dependency theory, world system or world economy theory, and most recently we talked about global value chains. So, two other questions related to this, let's call it an institutional approach, which has become more common in uh, economics. They've ignored institutions for a long time, uh, but they've learned something from the sociologists. Obviously, we have to teach these economists what it means to do sound, systematic, empirically founded in reality, not in these imaginary models they put together. Analysis. <clears throat> that was a long-winded way of saying that we, sociology, my discipline, is the broadest, most comprehensive discipline for understanding the world, the way it works, in terms of social behavior and social organization and social change. All right, one obviously uh, obvious question and a way to think about development. And if you think about the levels of analysis, think about the individual level, the organizational level, the national societal level and the global level. This, I would say, you know, kind of straddles between the organizational and the national level what kind of institutions exist, political and economic institutions in particular, because I think those are the most important as a political economist, what role do those play in ultimately generating and ensuring development, equitable development, shared prosperity, socioeconomic progress, however you want to define it. And some of you, when I asked you that question the first week, had identified factors which fall into this larger institutional arena. So that's the first way we can think about institutions. The other is, what are some of the institutional variations that exist across what we call capitalist nations? And I want to focus particularly on the major industrial, sometimes called advanced, that could be problematic, capitalist societies because we call them capitalist, but are they all the same? Notice on that first slide, I said capitalisms. Plural! That means multiple forms of capitalism. Okay, I'm getting excited. I like this stuff. All right. So there has been an institutional turn. This has been taking place over the last, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years, where economists or sociologists, political scientists, responding to the assumptions of 
neoclassical economics have rejected many of those assumptions and said you must include institutions. So we sometimes call this the institutional turn. We had something in sociology called the cultural turn. Simply means that people are beginning to recognize the fundamental importance of institutions in this case. So I like this quote that I take uh, Joseph Stiglitz and his authors. No example can be found in history of a process of development nested in an environment even vaguely, even vaguely resembling this institution free, I'm going to call it fairy tale of economic interactions that one finds in a good deal of contemporary economic theory. So if you've taken economics courses, microeconomics courses, macroeconomics courses, maybe the economics of development, I don't know what that particular course you took included, but the tendency has been to pretend that there are just markets and individuals or firms interacting in markets. And that is how we understand development. And obviously, that is utterly, utterly, what, what's the term? I, I'm trying not to use too strong a language. Uh, utterly inadequate, let's just put it that way. Inadequate uh, for understanding uh, development. So economy, economics merges with sociology. Economic sociology. That's a whole area of sociology, one of the fastest growing areas, and the area that I uh, associate myself with when people say, what kind of sociologist? I say, an economic sociologist. <clears throat> All right, so defining institutions in this literature, and it's done in a variety of different ways, depending on where people are coming from. Are they coming from a neoclassical economic position and then moving over to the institutional turn? Or... Are they political scientists considering institutions? Or are they sociologists who are trying to promote the importance of institutions? It really depends on where you come from, how you conceptualize the narrative that you bring to understanding the role of institutions. One way people have talked about this, institutions are rules of the game in a society. Rules of the games that try to direct constrain. Sometimes we talk about guardrails. People use this term all the time, guardrails. Okay? Enabling, incentivizing, coercing, requiring, mandating. Those are rules. They shape the actions of economic actors. Right? These, these institutions are created by humans. They're not naturally evolving. They set contrain, constraints, and they shape incentives, as I said. Okay? So when we think about economic institutions, economic rules of the game, one of the most fundamental is property rights. A lot of conservatives say, we need government to get out of the way and let the market decide. Free the market. The magic of the market. As if government has no role to play. We've already talked about this. Obviously, there are all kinds of institutional structures in place to ensure, you know, to put it bluntly, that capitalists rule, that they are able to dominate. The most important is property rights. The right to private property and the right to do with that property what you like. And, of course, contracts have to be enforced, uh, etc. Okay? So there's a lot we can say about that. That's the idea that we're trying to promote here. Uh, and economists try to promote when they begin to acknowledge the importance of institutions. Political institutions, of course, obviously. What are the political rules of the game? Democracy? We presumably live in a democracy. We have democratic institutions. Yes, we do. We have democratic institutions. Now, whether we actually have a democracy is another matter. But we have democratic institutions. We'll talk about it. A little bit about that distinction. It's a big part of political sociology. Uh, is it a dictatorship? Is it authoritarianism? Is it autocracy? Is it an oligarchy? Are there election laws? Are there ways for people to participate? It's a big issue now with 
the Republicans in various states, rolling back various um, voting rights. All of this stuff is contested. I want that to be emphasized. Economic institutions, how they work, is contested. You can go back to class conflict between capitalists and workers, bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And also in the political arena, you have the same kind of contestation. So these rules aren't fixed and they're not natural. All right. Now, another way to think about institutions is how should institutions operate? Is there a way that institutions should operate that would make them more effective, efficient, productive? Um, and let's say in the Weberian sense, Max Weber, Weberian sense, he talked about the ideal type bureaucracy. People who are put in positions of authority, decision-making positions, should be placed there based on what they know, what they've achieved. Well, we call these we call this meritocracy, where they got their degree. I do a lot of criticism of this stuff. Right? How they've been promoted, right? So one way people have thought about this is let's think about how an effective institution operating on what we would regard as the best acts, aspects of bureaucracy would work. Immunity from bribe taking and capturing by special interests. Now, this is the ideal situation, right? And I want you to think a little bit about how people have defined what an institution should look like, right? And that these are the institutions that should be in place in order for societies to develop like the United States, or sometimes people hold up the United States as the role model you might ask yourself how important all this really is, okay, because this is theoretical, practically how important this is, or to what extent does what is regarded as the most highly developed society in the world, we often think it's our country, the United States, deviates from many of these presumed necessary conditions, bribe-taking, campaign contributions, capture, regulatory capture, we talked about that. So I can't help, but it's hard for me to talk about this stuff abstractly without saying that these things are violated. But when people are trying to evaluate institutions and whether institutions have the characteristics that one would suggest or believe promotes development, these are the kinds of things they're talking about. No entrenched, concentrated, power sources that can either make new rules or subvert the rules. Embeddedness, and embeddedness means that the institution has some connection with stakeholders, the larger society. Technological flexibility, openness to external innovation. You don't have rigid bureaucracy that never changes. You realize that conditions change and institutions must also adapt. And this idea of countervailing power, I think I've made reference to this before. Labor is a form of countervailing power to capital. And is there countervailing power? Is there com competitiveness within institutions that ensure that one group does not entirely dominate? So when people talk about various characteristics of institutions, they touch on these things. One book that uh, made a big splash probably about 10 years ago, uh, I read it. Uh, it's a massive tome. It's one of those uh, door stoppers. Uh, I found it tedious because there was an enormous amount of really, really detailed historical examples, uh, which I'm much more interested in the conceptual, broad, theoretical ideas. Some people like all of that historical detail. I didn't. I found it a very, very tedious to read, dense. But the bottom line of this massive book that had an enormous influence and was representing, to a large extent, the economists who were making the institutional turn, uh, 
uh, by Osamaglu and Robinson. And basically, why nations fail, right? There's all kinds of books written with these kinds of titles, why some nations are rich, some nations are poor, why some nations prosper, and some, uh, you know, stagnate, etc. why nations fail. And their view was, why nations fail? Well, what makes a nation not fail? What do they mean by not fail? Sustained prosperity. And sustained prosperity requires, this is the bottom line argument, economic institutions that are inclusive and political institutions that are inclusive. And you can see the definitions. I'm not going to read them. I'm going to let you take a look at this. But I want to focus on uh, something that is a major, major emphasis here. Okay. Inclusive economic institutions enforce property rights. Okay, You can see they're coming from a certain kind of economic theoretical uh, background if they're emphasizing property rights, which they do. Okay, And that's you know, betrays their background a little bit uh, in terms of economics, pro-market, pro-capitalist. Okay. And some of these other things make perfect sense, create a, a level playing field for people to compete in a marketplace, if you have a capitalist uh, economy, uh, encouraging investments in new technologies. And by the way, you have inclusive economic institutions, good, and you have extractive economic institutions, bad, okay? And I have a little definition of what an extractive economic institution is. One of the problems with this, as I was reading this book, I began to get the same feeling I got when I used to read modernization literature. Well, the United States is the, you know, most highly developed country, and theoretically, the most highly developed country is highly developed because it has inclusive economic institutions. But then when you start looking closely at how they define inclusive economic institutions, and then you look at the actual practices economically in the United States, you begin to see some, some problems here, right? So sort of the glorification of the developed societies, because they have all these wonderful inclusive institutions, and the kind of degradation of poor societies, because they must have extractive economic institutions. You get that same kind of dynamic you find in modernization theory, which I find a little troubling. Inclusive political institutions distribute political power widely in a pluralistic manner. If you take my political sociology class, we talk about pluralism whether it exists in the United States or not. So maybe we should think about this as Weber talked about an ideal type bureaucracy, theoretically, conceptually, what it would look like, and what inclusive economic institutions would look like, what inclusive political institutions would look like. All this emphasis on property rights, I'll mention in a moment. All right, so I have some criticisms uh, of the book. I have lots of criticisms of this book. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. What I wanted to do was give you an example of a major piece of work that promotes the institutional perspective. So you understand what it is. And institutions are absolutely, absolutely critical, important to understand how societies develop. But there are different ways of looking at these institutions. And to some extent, we've talked about aspects of this before. Now, inclusive economic institutions, property rights, inclusive political institutions really should be based on citizenship rights. Capitalism, property rights. Capitalism, an economic institution. Democracy is based on citizenship rights. Democracy is a political institution. I know there's this belief that somehow democracy and capitalism go together and they reinforce each other. They don't. They are constantly in tension. Property rights give rights to people on the basis of how much property and wealth and income they have. 
that's the capitalist side. Democracy, theoretically, gives people rights on the basis of being a citizen and having the right to participate and vote and have an impact as a citizen on decisions that are made that affect them. That's a lot different than property rights. Property rights often stifle citizenship rights. And citizenship, citizenship rights, popular mobilization, are often directed toward limiting property rights, the ability of property owners and capitalists and corporations to do whatever the hell they want. This is a very, very important contradiction of capitalism. Tension? Totally unrecognized in this book. Also, China is a highly, highly successful economic system. The Chinese system. The Chinese Communist Party. Right? What about authoritarian capitalism? There's some markets there. But I wouldn't call the political institutions inclusive, but the economy has grown over the last 30 or 40 years, probably in the most prolific, significant way of any single nation uh, historically. There's a lot more we could say about China. So I'm just pointing out that it's possible to actually develop and create some level of prosperity, if you want to call it that, um, without inclusive political institutions. Remember, we also talked about bureaucratic authoritarianism, right? In fact, often capitalists who want to invest freely propose that we limit democracy. Again, this contradiction. I'm trying to point out the contradiction. Uh, there is a distinction here between what we call de jure and de facto. The example I used before, we have democratic institutions. We have formal democratic institutions, which would suggest that we have a democratic society. De facto is, well, in fact, what really happens. What's the reality? Day to day. How does the system really fundamentally work maybe deviates from the de jour, the formal democratic institutions. Right? There's a, a sociologist uh, star, he talks about civil oligarchy. What he means by that is we have these civil democratic institutions, but despite those institutions, institutions, the institutions have not prevented enormous, enormous concentration of power in the hands of a very small number of people in the United States. De jour, democratic institutions, democratic rules. De facto, I would agree with Starr, uh, we have an oligarchy in terms of the concentration of power. Creative destruction, this is a big part of the analysis. They say there should always be operating creative destruction. What this means is that there may be some elites, there may be some corporations that have dominated the economy for a long time, have developed certain technologies, certain methods, certain products. But if you have an inclusive economic system, there should be competition. There should be ability of new corporations to emerge and for those corporations to be destroyed as new corporations and methods and techniques related to economic um, production emerge. Is creative destruction allowed or prevented? Can you think of corporations in the United States that have a stranglehold on moving us forward because they are not able, <clears throat> because they prevent the competitiveness that one would associate with inclusive economic institutions. The iron law of oligarchy essentially says that over time, there's going to be a tendency toward a small number 
of organizations or individuals, power sources, concentrating power over time, and then preventing democratic participation and competition. And finally, one thing they totally ignore, colonialism, imperialism, American interventionism, where do the institutions that exist in less developed countries come from? Do they stem organically? To what extent are those institutions a product of American foreign military policy? I will point to one area that I've discussed before, the Northern Triangle, where many people flee and they want to come across the U.S. border from El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Honduras. And somebody might say their institutions are characterized by the concentrated power of an oligarchy and they're corrupt. Well, let's look at the long history of American intervention in shaping those institutions. All right, so if you wanted to create a typology, I sometimes encourage students to just think typologically. This is their thesis. Sustained prosperity requires inclusive economic institutions and inclusive political institutions. So on the economic side, you have inclusive versus extractive. That's the dichotomy. Political, inclusive versus extractive. Inclusive, inclusive, that's what you want, sustained prosperity. I don't know what they would call extractive and extractive. I've just said sustained poverty. The more interesting cases would be the mixed cases, where you might have an inclusive political system, but a more extractive economic system. Or a extractive economic system, but a more uh, inclusive uh, political system, okay? These mixed cases, extractive economic, inclusive political, or inclusive economic, extractive political. Okay. Once we broaden this, we begin to think about uh, cases that are probably more realistic as existing in the world today. Uh, they tried to do some empirical analysis. These are economists. They wrote a bunch of articles. The book they wrote uh, is written uh, to be accessible to as many people as possible, so they don't put a lot of quantitative regression analysis. This is just a basic, uh, you know, uh, bivariate scatter plot. And they're looking at the GDP, so they're viewing that as a measure of prosperity. We know all the problems with that measure, okay, but let's just put that aside for a moment. And the protection against risk of expropriation. Now, why the hell are they looking at the relationship between these two things? I often ask students this when I'm in a class. We have a nice discussion about that. We can't do that. What do they mean by expropriation? Well, expropriation means the ability of the government to actually confiscate, nationalize, socialize property that's in the hands of perhaps the oligarchy, land expropriation, or corporate expropriation. You nationalize. So what they're talking about here is they do an analysis to see um, the extent to which there are laws that make it illegal, that prevent the government from in any way encroaching on property rights. That's, that's the broadest way to think about this. And so what they show here is the greater the protection of property rights, measured by protection against the risk of expropriation, the greater the development. Okay. So you can see they have a certain kind of um, bias here that they should reveal. I reveal my biases. I think you know what they are. You can call them biases, you can call them political tendencies, preferences, visions of a better world. Uh, here's another interesting uh, graph uh, where they show the trajectory, the developmental, developmental trajectory of two societies. And one of the reasons they do this is they call it like a natural experiment. You have basically a country that was divided in half, so you're controlling for all of the presumed cultural etc. differences between these two countries that were at one time one, right? So they feel like they don't have to control for that. And one has promoted a more, let's say, capitalist road, the other has 
promoted a more communist road, and they show that, not surprisingly, and certainly confirming their hypothesis, South Korea has done uh, much better uh, economically. Okay. So uh, it's interesting to see how they uh, empirically analyze their thesis. Now, you know, we, like I said, we always hold up the United States as being the most advanced, prosperous country in the world, at least for some. Oh, I had to throw that in. Okay. Right? I mean, you know, people, listen, it's the most advanced, developed society in the world. And I, I always ask the question, well, then it shouldn't be extractive. It should be inclusive, according to their theory. And here's how they define the extractive states. Extractive, the bad ones, the ones that shouldn't develop. Extractive states are controlled by a ruling elite whose objective is to extract as much wealth as they can from the rest of society. That sounds a lot like the United States today to me. Certainly under neoliberalism. And I just give a small empirical tidbit. During the economic recovery after the great financial crisis 2009 to 2012, if you want to call this a recovery, okay, recovery for some, that's for sure, in the U.S., I think I mentioned this earlier, 95% of the growth in income was controlled by the top 1%. I think that pattern of distribution is consistent with their definition of an extractive state. So let's not celebrate. All right. Varieties of capitalism. There is no alternative. What we have in the United States is the highest, most advanced level of capitalism that has evolved naturally. So quit complaining. There is no alternative. You must accept what exists. Okay. Well, clearly, we know better than that, don't we? We all know better than that. There are lots of alternatives. The elite don't want you to ever imagine alternatives to what exists in your society. But that's the basis on which people join social movements and make political progress. So, my point here is, we have talked about capitalism as a system, neoliberal capitalism. I tried to emphasize that neoliberal capitalism is most extreme predatory in the United States compared to other societies that are called capitalist. So there's a huge literature, some of you may be interested in this if you want to pursue it further, called Varieties of Capitalism. Most fundamentally, what explains the variation is the extent to which the society depends on the market to allocate resources or the state. And it's not all state, all market. We talk about mixed economies. There used to be a lot of talk years ago. That was a term that was used. It's a mixed economy. What does that mean? There are markets and there is state intervention, state direction, state uh, confiscation of wealth and income, redistribution. Market versus state as it regulates the economy, work, living standards, etc. We talked about fiscal policy, taxing and spending, labor market institutions. I discussed this in great detail in the Sociology of Work, where we talk about the different kinds of experiences of workers in capitalist. And when I talk about capitalism here, we're talking primarily, as I said, about the major industrial society. And social welfare policy. These are three major areas where you see market versus state variations across the major industrial societies. And theorists Political economists, because this is political economy, have tried to categorize nations. So you've got the Anglo-Saxon capitalist model. Some people say that's U.S. and Britain. You have a communitarian, that's sometimes a term used. 
And, you know, we can quibble over this terminology and, you know, who fits into what. I'm just trying to give you an example of how people have thought about these varieties. Germany and Japan, communitarian. A little more refined, market-based, liberal, as in classical liberal, U.S., Asian, communitarian, often Japan, different, different form of capitalism, both capitalist societies. The point here is, let me, let me just make a broader point here. They are all capitalist societies to the extent that the means of production, the means of production, the corporations, the factories, the businesses are largely privately owned by capitalists. Okay? It's the case in all of these countries. I know people talk about, you know, sometimes Sweden is a socialist. No, it's a capitalist country. But it's a capitalist country that is very social democratic. So you have con continental capitalism, social democratic capitalism, Mediterranean capitalism. You understand? And if you ask what's the difference between the countries in these categories, one will automatically go to institutions and the extent to which market institutions rule, state institutions, the balance and the relationship between those two. In the U.S., we're the most extreme market neoliberal capitalist society among the major industrial capitalist nations. Liberal, conservative, social democratic. Liberal is, uh, should be actually on the right. Okay, that's the most conservative. Social democratic on the left. Uncoordinated market. The U.S. would fall into that category. Very little intervention, very little coordination. Lots of uh, deregulation. And coordinated market, much more government direction, much more government intervention, <clears throat> and much more regulation. Augusta uh, Esping Anderson, a major, major political economist, major figure, wrote some of the most influential works that have impacted the way I have thought about all this. I uh, spent a lot of time talking about the worlds of welfare capital. He focused on a social welfare state. And he did make this distinction between the liberal welfare capitalism, conservative welfare capitalism, social democratic capitalism. Examples, U.S., Germany, Sweden, respectively. Decommodification. What does that mean? Right. That means that there are Things available to the citizens that do not have to be purchased in a market, but are given to them as a right. Think about health care. Just think about health care as the example. That's the one most people think about today in conversations in the United States, right? Has it been decommodified? In a social democratic society, it's provided to everybody for free. You do not have to access it in a marketplace where you pay for it, and where the amount you get and the quality depends on how much money you have. Decommodification is removing the fundamental requirements of life from exclusive market control, for-profit control, okay? <clears throat> Social rights, Welfare provision, the kind of benefits that people get. There's a lot we could say about all these. Again, trying to give you a little flavor. Sometimes say flavors of capitalism. A little flavor of the variations that exist. One of the reasons I think it's important for students to understand this is they often assume that the capitalism that exists in the United States is just, you know, this is the best form of capitalism. If you show them that there are other capitalist societies that still have markets, 
that still respect property rights, but that are able to provide the citizens a higher quality of life. That's important, because then we can start thinking about what we can learn from these societies. All right, so these are all terms that come into play. Uh, some people have argued that all of these capitalist countries are beginning to converge toward neoliberalism. To what extent is there still a difference? Okay. And people have been charting this over the last 30 or 40 years to see whether what we've seen develop in the United States is a general trend or whether there still remains, persists, fundamental differences, even though all of these nations in one form or another have adopted some kind of neoliberal political economic philosophy. Path dependence, what that means is that the possibility of transforming political economic institutions today depends on what has come before. What path have we taken historically, which constrains us, makes us dependent upon certain political economic structures? Corporatism is a term, sometimes people use corporatism to describe the fact that corporations rule in the United States. But corporatism is a term in political economy, political science, that historically has meant that in the society, Political economic policies are determined by a kind of um, accord where labor, business, and government meet, negotiate, and put in place policies trying to represent the interest of all groups. We don't have a corporatist system in the United States. It's much more common in Europe, I've talked about commodification, decommodification. A social wage means that you receive income for not working. That's what a social wage is. That is, you receive benefits from the government independent of selling your labor power. And we know this is a big debate now because they can't find workers and they think, you know, we've got to push people back in the labor force, therefore cut off their social wage so they have nothing to sell but their labor power to survive. Flex security is a term that's been used in some of the Nordic, by the Nordic, I mean Norway, Sweden, Finland. Okay. Flex security, it's kind of a compromise. On the one hand, you give businesses, you don't restrict the ability of businesses to restructure, lay off workers, downsize. That's the flex, you give them flexibility. The security side, comes from security, is you have in place protections for those workers who are subjected to those fundamental changes. Sometimes I talk about this idea of how does a bumblebee fly? <laughs> and that is, I don't study um, insects, okay? I don't know anything about them. But actually, structurally, you would, if you did study insects, the movement of insects, what, what you know, um, structurally would be required to be aeronautically able, if that makes any sense. I'm trying to talk in a sophisticated way. People have said the bumblebee is structurally shouldn't be able to fly. Well, people have used this kind of analogy to talk about, look at the Nordic countries. Look at how much taxation there is. Look at how much redistribution there is. Look at how much decommodification there is. How do those countries grow and expand? And how come they're so prosperous? How do those bumblebees, because they deviate from the neoclassical assumptions about what's required for economic growth and expansion, how do they fly? How do they grow? And again, this introduces the idea of varieties of capitalism. There was a period when, you know, people would say, 
in the United States. It's like the workers in the United States have had a very, very difficult time over the last 20 or 30 years with outsourcing and offshoring and globalization. They've been beaten up. And, you know, the Democratic Party has, you know, which totally abandoned concerns for most of the working class. They say, look, you know, these are conditions beyond our control. Globalization is inevitable and it's going to have negative effects on workers in all countries. And some researchers, some really, really great researchers, by the way, who wrote one of the best books on global value chains, Outsourcing Economics is the name of the book. They did this study. They said, well, let's look at all these countries that are equally exposed to globalization like the United States. Has the effect on workers been the same in all those countries? You probably know what the answer is. No, it hasn't. And I will let you read this quote because it's very important. The effect of globalization on the workers in these countries depends on the labor market institutions, the social welfare institutions, and the fiscal policies of those capitalist countries. Some countries have done a much better job of protecting their workers from the negative effects of globalization than others. Very important research that debunks this argument, oh, there's nothing we can do, it's just globalization. Get more education. That's what Democrats always say. Just get more education. That's, that's the answer to all problems. That's why all of you are taking classes now. You assume it's going to... I, okay, I'm not going to go down that road. Okay. American exceptionalism. All right. <clears throat> this graph, table, shows the extent to which the benefits provided by the government addresses poverty, that is, reduces the poverty rate. Okay. So here's the point. Capitalism produces poverty even in the advanced countries. There always are, is going to be a segment of the population. We can talk about which segment that is. I don't want to go into that. So the question is, after the government intervenes with government benefits, social programs, social welfare, to what extent does that impact the poverty rate? And this shows which countries the intervention does the most and the intervention actually does the least. Who's on the bottom? The United States. So the next time somebody tells you that the welfare system is too generous, what you need to tell them, because that's utterly... I mean, may, they might think it's absolutely too generous, but relatively, the United States is the least generous social welfare state among countries we should be comparing ourselves to, as I mentioned before, Organization of Economic Cooperation Development. Here's a relationship between social expenditures and a relative poverty rate. All right. Notice the U.S. has one of the highest poverty rates, and of course, it has one of the lowest levels of social expenditure. So there's obviously a correlation between these. I'm going to go through these quickly. You can study them in more detail. Child poverty. Something people might be concerned about. Well, adults, you know, it's one thing. But, you know, children, the most vulnerable. And we have the highest level, well, just about we, the highest level. Uh, other than Turkey, Mexico, and Israel, and I think Israel must be there maybe because they're including the Palestinian population. High levels of child poverty. Now, Biden's uh, proposals, and child tax credit, some of his other proposals, would make a significant difference here. But they have to be permanently in place, not just a one-year policy that expires after the crisis has ended, of course, this crisis is persisting. So this is not the poverty rate. This is where always, year after year after year, there's nothing to do with COVID. 
the U.S. has the highest child poverty rate. Government mandated leave and holidays, paid or unpaid, <laughs> paid holidays, paid annual leave, zero. We are exceptional. I will say that. Per capita expenditures on health, many of you may be familiar with this because there's been a big debate about Medicare for all and, you know, we said universal health care. United States spends more on health care than any other country by far. And we have subpar public health outcomes. Now, if we spent the most and we saw that the population was really, really healthy compared to other countries, we'd say, well, it's worth it. But remember, the reason you see this is because the U.S. has a commodified, not decommodified, commodified healthcare system. We've already talked about inequality. The United States has basically the highest level of inequality, except for a few other countries that we typically would not want to be comparing ourselves to. All right, I'm just showing you a bunch of these little graphs. This is one that tries to categorize countries on the basis of the relationship between the size of employers and the Gini coefficient. The higher the coefficient, the greater the inequality. You see the United States always off the map um, as well. And then they try to categorize the countries that fall into this bivariate relationship. The link, we always talk about social mobility, right? Some people have assumed that, you know, in the United States, anybody can be a millionaire. There's lots of movement. There's lots of social mobility. Well, if you've taken my intro to sociology class or probably sex, race, and social class, uh, you should know uh, that, in fact, uh, the United States does not have the highest level of social mobility. And what this shows is what's the correlation between your parents socioeconomic status and yours as an adult. The tighter that relationship, obviously, the lower the level of social mobility. And this graph shows the tightness. The higher the bar, the greater the tightness, where parents' income is what predicts child's income. Collective bargaining, this gets us into labor market institutions. The United States has very, very weak collective bargaining coverage. That means people who are members of a labor union, and that translates into poverty. So, again, you can look at all these graphs. You can see that there's wide variation across these nations. <clears throat> I often ask students, as I have before, right, what's the hypothesis supported by this graph? The greater the inequality, and by the way, the United States has the highest level of income and wealth inequality among major industrial societies we would want to compare ourselves to. The greater the, I'm sorry, yes, the greater the immobility, okay? So that vertical axis, uh, axis the vertical axis, okay, the higher you are on that, the less mobility exists. That's why it's immobility. Okay? The higher the score, the less social mobility. So the policy implication is if you want to address this problem where the United States seems to have less social mobility than we would like, you're going to have to do something about the distribution of income and wealth. That's the policy implication. Health expenditures as percentage share of GDP, again, we spend more than everyone else. And we have one of the highest infant mortality rates. Look at all the countries that have lower infant mortality rates in the United States. Life expectancy. We lag behind. 
We're not getting our money's worth. This is an interesting one. This is the relationship between church attendance and welfare spending. And there is a hypothesis here. Let me move this so you can read it. I just think this is interesting. Something to think about. Uh, introduces a whole set of new issues. Uh, there is something called the Engelhart thesis. It's Ronald Engelhart. His thesis is that when countries provide a lot of protection to their uh, citizens, remember the U.S. provides very little protection. Uh, there are many European societies that provide much more. There will be less of an attachment to religion. So the idea is that religion somehow is a substitute spiritually, emotionally, for a lack of security. So the greater the state provides the basics, the fundamentals, the requirements of life, the less likely one is religious. Okay. Now there's a lot of mechanisms that make that connection. We're not going to go into it. You can read this piece, um, this excerpt I took from the article. Something very interesting to think about. All right, let's see where we are. I think we're almost done. We're going to get this. All right, so take a look, if you like, at the um, these videos. I think I did ask you, require you to look at George Lackey's, because I think, or Lakey, uh, because I think he does a good job of addressing some of the questions people have when one promotes the, I will say, the political economic performance superiority of Nordic countries. Uh, there's a little excerpt from Michael Moore's film, Where to Invade Next. He talks about some comparisons between the United States and France. Uh, it's quite humorous, quite entertaining. Um, so these links are for your intellectual edification to get a better understanding of some of what I'm trying to communicate here. Um, well, we are still, you know, we are the most democratic country in the world, right? We are the model democracy for... No, we're not. Okay. I guess I'm on a roll here. I'm trying to just burst the bubble. Uh, some of you may know this because I make reference to it in some of my other classes. There is something called the Electoral Integrity Project. And these researchers look at all of the major Western democracies on a bunch of factors, and they put them together into a scale to determine which countries have the highest level of electoral integrity. Electoral integrity. When you ask people in the United States, why do you say you live in a, a democracy? They'll say, well, because we have elections. Because we can vote. Sometimes. <laughs> Some of us can. More easily than others. We can vote. We can participate in the electoral process. Well, it turns out, on that dimension of democracy, we are at the bottom. It's shocking to many people, right? How is it that the United States has the lowest score on electoral integrity? Well, we have gerrymandering. Okay, we know about that. These, uh, you know, congressional districts carved out by Republican or Democratic legislatures. The system is entirely decentralized. Voting rules here, voting rules there, voting rules in one state, voting rules in another. That's absurd. These other countries have a national system. You cannot allow different states to be determining who is eligible, how to vote, on what days, at what times. We restrict third parties. We only have two parties. That's a huge undemocratic aspect of our society. You have partisan control of election administration. The supervisor of elections in Duval County is a longtime Republican. And he's in charge of determining how elections will be conducted in Duval County. We have all these voter registration problems. Rather than you're a citizen, you have a Social Security card, you're a citizen, you can vote, period. Election day is on Tuesday. That makes a lot of sense. 
Again, two parties versus multi. So you put all this stuff together. Sorry, folks, we're at the bottom. We are number one on military spending. Okay. So if you think that you know we're on the bottom of something, we're number one. Okay. All right. Let me finish with a quote I take, I put in my book on social and economic development. I think it's important because sometimes we get into this mindset, this is the best system in the world. That's the best system in the world. So this is a great quote from Alec Novi. Here and elsewhere, we must never forget that perfect systems exist only in books. The real world, East, West, irrationalities, misallocation, misemployment of resources, waste. In the real world, socialist, social democratic, capitalist, there will always be intractable, intractable problems, contradictions. And I like what he says here. It's a good thing these contradictions exist because if they didn't, First of all, the world would be boring and intolerable, and intolerably dull, and people like me would be threatened with unemployment because, you know, who would turn to sociologists if everything was so predictable and worked beautifully? But we must learn from the things that go wrong in the hope that by doing so, we will diminish the ill effects of predictable troubles. And that is the most important point. We know what kind of system we live in. We know what the consequences of that system are. We know there are alternative ways to organize our political economy, to diminish the ill effects of predictable troubles. But there are vested interests. Okay? Extractive political institutions, if you like, that thwart the ability to fundamentally transform, change, modify, reform, whatever term you want to use, American capitalism. All right, on that note, thank you, and I will see you next week.